Welcome back to the Alts Podcast. I'm your host, Horatio Ruiz. We bring you industry leaders and creators to give their insights on the rapidly changing and exciting world of alternative assets. Opinions expressed on this podcast by the host and podcast guests are for informational purposes only and should not be considered investment advice. Podcast hosts and guests may maintain positions in the offerings discussed in this podcast. Today's guest is Michael Berezlovsky. Michael is the CEO and founder of Domain Magnate, an online business brokerage. Domain Magnate also has an online business fund open to qualified investors. In this episode, Michael and I talk about the nuances of buying online businesses, including the skills needed to start one and to keep it running. Michael also gives some advice on how to start your own online business and the trends he's seeing for the rest of the year. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Michael. All right, so we're very uh, fortunate here today to speak to Michael Berzlowski. He's the founder and CEO of Domain Magnate, acquires, um, invests in online businesses. Michael, thank you very much for being here. Hi, Horacio. Uh, glad to be here. So uh, in researching you and the company, uh, Domain Magnate, I know that you have a, a specialty in online businesses, but uh, I kind of want to leave it up to you. You know, In your own words, how would you describe what Domain Magnate is? and um, how your kind of business has uh, evolved over time? Yeah, good question. So we are a micro private equity firm. We buy uh, and grow online businesses under $1 million in value. And we've been involved in that for about 16 years now. And the industry has grown tremendously. Uh, You know, I was starting with this business back in 2004, 2005. And at that time, there was no industry like that. You couldn't really buy an online business. You couldn't buy a website. Uh, There were no marketplaces, no brokerage firms, nothing like that, really. You you, you would not be able to get a loan or anything like that for an online business. And now it's a really huge uh, industry. For example, one company that's doing something rather similar to what we are doing recently raised $2 billion to buy online businesses. Wow. So the, the market is really heating up. How were you able to adapt over time with that? At what point did you realize that the business was changing, that um, domains and buying online businesses was something that you could turn a profit on? Yeah, so it took me a few years of initially experimenting with different models, different businesses, to realize that this is the big opportunity to, to focus on. And also something that fits well with my skills. I liked looking at markets. I liked making deals. And I was pretty good at it. Uh, and, and this was the, the market to focus on that kept growing. And initially, I've developed all kinds of skills. And, and uh, we've, we've built a team to help manage those different businesses. We focus primarily on promoting them through SEO and building organic traffic. And it's been a constant adaptation, like you mentioned, Russia. Uh, It's interesting because as the industry evolved, there is a lot more competition now among buyers. But at the same time, it's easier to sell. And uh, if you have been in it for a while, you have the advantage in in networking, in being able to find better deals. So that helps us a lot. I'm, I'm so curious. Like, How do you decide which online businesses to buy? What are some maybe some metrics that you look for? And how is it that you go about making something even more profitable, right? So like you might you might identify a good opportunity and be like, we can make this even better. Could you take me through that process? Yeah, sure. So first of all, we have our public criteria. If anyone wants to check it out, it's at domainmagnate.com slash criteria. And that involves our strategic criteria, like we are looking for businesses that have primarily traffic from from Google uh, organic search, that have like specific revenue sources that are that can be run completely remotely, that you don't have to be tied to any specific location. And there is a few other things like that. We also have legal criteria and ethical criteria, so we wouldn't buy businesses that are at that pose some significant legal risks or things that that. Uh, are completely uh, unethical, like they promote violence or hate or things like that. 
And besides that, of course, we have our price criteria that the businesses have to be reasonably priced within the current market range. So, so this set of criteria is basically the initial framework that we work with. And we would look at every deal, first of all, to see if it fits those. And then the next step is we have our own due diligence framework. So with every business, we look uh, at three different perspectives. The first is the numbers. So we review the trends, we review um, the revenues and the prices versus the, the revenues and profits. And then we look at risks. What are the biggest risks to the business? And that's actually the most important part, assessing the risks. And then we look at the opportunities. How can we grow this business? What are the opportunities to expand? And through that network, we analyze the business and kind of go further and further within levels as we get closer to a deal and then make a decision based on which business presents the best opportunities through through that framework. Well, so, so it seems like a pretty rigorous. And like you said, you, you've assembled a team, right? So I imagine you have different um, groups within your team that is responsible for each part of that process. Yeah, that's right. But uh, I'd say it's a mix between just, just my gut feeling, frankly. <laughs> I've done a few hundred deals and often what I see is uh, I kind of just like see if r- right away this is something that's likely to be a good deal or not. And of course, we yeah. do all the checks, we do all the analysis, but it is a mix of of that gut feeling and just analyzing the numbers and everything in the data. Yeah. So that's one aspect of your uh, business. You, you know, you invest in the online business and then you kind of, you run it. Are there uh, any opportunities for somebody that say is interested in getting into an online business, and they come to you for advice into, uh, you know, hey, what should I buy, Michael? You know, because I, I kind of wanna, I want, like you said, I want something that maybe I'm allowed to work from home. And you offer consulting uh, services like that? Yeah, that's a good question. We do offer some consulting, and I would say it, it really depends. It depends, and the third step is usually to understand what is your budget range. What are your different expertise, advantages? And as you uh, look more into that, you can get a better idea of what type of business you, you might want to buy and also understand better what are some things that you need to know in order to operate that business. So I would say for people who want to get into that and buy a business on their own, to operate it on their own, it's quite a time-consuming endeavor and thirst because you really have to know a lot of different things about it. Uh, and I genuinely recommend starting very small. Like go and buy a very small website first for like a, a few hundred or a few thousand dollars only. And then once you've managed it for a bit and feel comfortable, then it's time to really go and invest in a serious business. So that suggestion that you have is buy this small website and run it. And not necessarily with the intention of of making it a grand or a big company but just so that you then get the experience of what it takes yeah absolutely because uh, what happens most commonly is people go and buy a business and they they might go and get an sba loan for a million dollars or they might just have their own capital maybe hundred thousand couple hundred thousand dollars and they go and buy a business and and then they immediately realize that they have no idea what to do with it after they've acquired it they they try to find someone to operate it, but it's not so easy if you are not, if you don't have enough experience, it's not easy to find a good uh, team to manage it. So typically that just doesn't work very well. Uh, and the differences between running a, a million dollar or a hundred thousand dollar business versus like a thousand dollar website, they are not as substantial as you might think because you, you would generally face more or less the same challenges just on a different scale. So I think it's really the best training to go and buy a small website. It can be just just for under a thousand dollars. You can buy a small website that brings some revenue, and you manage it for for a few months, so maybe half a year, a year, and that would give you a very good idea of, of what to expect uh, as as a sort of training. You know, what kind of skills are required to start an online business? Yeah, so so it would depend, of course, on the type of business. But let's take as an example a content business. So if you have a content business, first of all, how, how it operates, uh, it, it has a lot of content. It's a website with, with a different articles on a different topic. Uh, let's say you have a website about dogs. So you would have content about uh, different dog breeds and, and, 
and maybe promote different products that, that you can buy for your dog and so on and how to train your dog and the way to so so what would be some different challenges to operate a website like that uh, first of all you need to keep updating the content and that generally has to be done maybe once a month once every few months you need to add some new articles you need to go and edit and update some existing articles then you would have to do some seo make sure that things are optimized so you need some at least some basic seo background you need to know how wordpress works because most websites now operate on WordPress, also uh, just the basics. Then you would also need to understand a little bit about researching competitors, understand about keyword research, topic research, how to grow a website. You'll need to know the monetization about affiliate marketing, how to review, compare, how to find better affiliate offers, how to monetize a website through, through ads. I need to need to have some very basic technical understanding of what a domain name is, what web hosting is, how it all works, how to deal with some occasional downtime or other technical issues. And that's just a, just a number of things you need to know. So there is a few more of those. There's so many skills involved there. Um, but like you kind of said, you need to know a lot. Uh, and But necessary, to begin, you don't necessarily need to have a depth of knowledge, right? You kind of need to have the scope to where your, your knowledge is kind of broad and you know you have a, a capability of doing different things. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, a friend of mine uh, recently approached me and said that his daughter, who was 18, was interested in you know, starting her own business. So, she, she, so he decided that maybe he would buy a website for her so that she can grow it and kind of make money and learn this way. And at first I was pretty skeptical. So I just sent her uh, a quick email now a couple of weeks ago with, with the details of what she needs to know, just the basics, like here is how you get a domain name, here is where you have the hosting, this is like some basics about WordPress, and this is kind of about monetization, like Google AdSense and so on. And uh, I tried to make it as simple as possible so she can get started. And then he says that she just looked at it and she was just like, no, nah, that's not for me, that's way too much stuff. She was just completely overwhelmed by that. <laughs> and change their mind about running a website. I would say it's quite a bit more complex than most people understand. That, that, yeah, that whole process is so interesting. And um, just the fact that you can monetize uh, a content website, right? Uh, quick question with that. Let's say you have that WordPress, right? You're st which is kind of the, the way that you can design your website. Is the monetization and the built into the website to where you're not creating that from scratch, right? Like WordPress offers features where you can monetize your website. Is that, is that how kind of that typically works? Uh, no, not really. So if you buy a website, then usually if you buy an existing website that's already profitable, then usually you would inherit all that monetization. So you would just take over all the accounts. Let's say it's monetized through a, an affiliate program like Commission Junction. So you would just have your own account and you replace all the affiliate IDs. So you would take over the account of the previous owner and everything is already um, in, in the website. But if you are building a new website and you're starting to get some traffic and you're thinking how to monetize it, then you need to do the research and figure out what are the best, the best options to monetize it. And the easiest way to do it, by the way, is just to check uh, your competitors and see how they're monetizing their websites. I'm going to get into uh, more about Domain uh, Magnate in a little bit. I saw a, a recent podcast that you were on and, and you told a little story about how you um, had saved up some money and you used that money to attend some courses right, on how to make money. Um, I think this is maybe your most recent one. And you found that you didn't it didn't work out for you and, and you, you came out and said it was a disappointment. Can you talk about that journey? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so back when I was starting out, it was a very different landscape back in 2004, 2005. So right now when we are in 2022, if you want to start a online business, uh, you, you, you do a quick Google search and there is hundreds of different courses, maybe thousands of different uh, articles, podcasts, tutorials, guides, that videos that tell you how to get started with this or that idea in business, how to make a lot of money. And back then there was nothing like that. It just didn't exist because it was all so new. 
Uh, in fact, back in 2005, uh, if I told people that I had an online business or that I was sort of working on this online business, they just didn't think that it was serious. Uh, people just thought, oh, okay, you, you have a personal blog, you know, very, very nice, but what do you actually do for a living? And uh, back in 2006, uh, the first time I sort of started making some, some serious money, I came to my, I was living in Israel and I came to a bank to deposit a check from Google was a check for I think about thirteen thousand dollars, and uh, they were quite surprised. So they asked me, "Well, uh, do you work for Google?" And I said, "No." So I work with them. I use the advertising network. I have a network of websites, and I place the ads, and they pay me the commission for showing the ads on my website. And then the bank clerk just looked at me and asked again, "So do you work for Google?" <laughs> And I said no, and then I explained again, and and then they called up the vice president of the branch, and I explained the same thing again, and then at the end I just said, yeah, I just work for Google. I said, okay, so you work for Google, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because the people just couldn't uh, accept that concept of making money online, and so there were a couple courses at the time actually that promised you to to teach you how to make money. And I bought a couple of them, and I had like all the money I had to my name back when I, back back then as a, as a poor student, probably like a thousand dollars or a couple thousand dollars, and I spent most of that on buying some different courses that promised to help me uh, make money, and that didn't work. <laughs> they were mostly scams or just not not very practical. So I just had to figure it all by myself and try different things and test different things. It was very exciting and interesting, and eventually it did work, and it was very exciting. When you have courses like that, right, it's, it's, and they're, they're all over the place. You're kind of, the first thing that comes to my mind is, man, I'm very skeptical about those things. And I wonder, you know, now that you've reached a certain stage in your career, how you feel about, you know, giving out advice. You mentioned your, your friend's daughter. What would be the advice that you would give to somebody that's starting up, you know, whether it's taking a course like that or you know, like you said, learning on your own, but also seeking out maybe some mentors. Yeah, I think now courses, actually, there are quite a few really good courses. So we we had an interview on our podcast with the Main Magnate Show with, with uh, Income School, which is a course. Um, it's not just a course. It's basically a program. It's kind of like an online school where they take you over a period of, of a couple of years through this entire process of starting your own business, finding a niche, setting up a blog, like all the technical things and monetizing it and all that. And they've had, I think, a few hundred people already who, who made enough money from that to quit their job. And then they had thousands of people who were making some, some good side income from that. So I think there are definitely some good, good courses, good learning opportunities now. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I kind of want to move over into uh, the Domain Magnate Fund. You started that in 2019. Uh, and I'm kind of wondering if you could describe what it entails and really what drove you to create a, a, a fund of online businesses. Is it domain names? Could you describe what that is? Sure. So we have, we've tried a few different uh, options for working with investors. And currently we have two ways that we do that. The one is with buy managed program where people who have some capital, they come to us and, and say, hey, we have this uh, 100,000 or a couple hundred thousand dollars and we want to go and buy a website and buy an online business and manage and grow it to make money. But we don't really know what or how to do it. So we want to give you that money so you can do it for us. And that's the service that we provide. We charge some fees and then we... We take the criteria and the capital that they have and the price range, and we find them a deal. We share all the details. We are very transparent about everything. And we buy and we operate a business for them. That's one service for people who want to own businesses directly. And the other service is through these different funds. So right now we have uh, sort of three small funds. Uh, actually, actually two. The first one uh, we, that we started back in... Um, 2019 that uh, was recently closed and that returned good um, good profits to investors and then we have our second fund 
and the third, which is a small group by with just recently uh, start as well. And our plan going forward is uh, setting up a small uh, group buys, which is easier than a fund because it, it can be done faster with less less um, less paperwork. There are a few requirements. It's open to non-accredited investors as well. And uh, what it is is simply we raise some capital, and people generally can invest between fifty thousand to a hundred thousand or so as a minimum. And we have maybe five, 10 investors, and that allows us to go and buy one business or, or sometimes two businesses in that range. Yeah. And this is also the perfect uh, price range to be in right now with the best deals somewhere between mid six figures to low seven figures. And the way it works is we, we, we acquire a business, we operate, we grow it. Typically, we look at the time frame of two to three years before we optimize it fully and resell the business. And they also distribute uh, quarterly profits, dividends. And uh, as soon as we resell the business, we uh, distribute all the profits, share between the investors, and basically close it up and start the next one. So we keep it very simple. So when you're buying these businesses for the fund, you're looking at a, about a, a three-year hold period? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, then, and then with the expectation of uh, whatever the profits are from the business get shared, and then as the business grows in value because of its growth, once it's sold, that also obviously gets, um, that's how you make the money. You mentioned that one of the funds is open to non-accredited investors. That would be the third fund I think that you described? Yeah, that's correct. That's our group buy. Uh, we call it a group buy because it's not it's not really a fund uh, in the sense that it, it doesn't meet all the requirements by SEC to be called a fund. Got it. But the minimum investment will still, you're saying somewhere between fifty dollars to $100,000? Yeah, that's right. Do you ever, because, you know, we work with um, these fractional platforms and where they're selling assets, right? Um, let's say a collection of wine and the, the there might be 300 bottles in this collection. Uh, and let's say it's, the whole collection might be worth $100,000. But what what is, you know, kind of good about these platforms is that for as little as $50, right, a share, because it is a fund and, you know, you're buying a security, you can invest in it. Do you ever see your uh, you creating something like that to where it's open to maybe somebody that has, you know, maybe a thousand dollars or a couple hundred dollars to invest? Yeah, we looked into that at some point and researched all the different uh, fractional investment platforms. The challenge is, first of all, they charge quite a bit of uh, money themselves. The platforms they usually charge around ten percent, and it's it's a bit complicated. So we prefer to do funds with a direct then we don't need to pay to a platform. And also that there is a limited number of investors, maybe five, 10 people. So it's much easier, much faster, easier to manage. Uh, and it can be more effective that we can quickly deploy capital once we have a really good deal uh, and we can manage it easier. I guess uh, you know another part of, um, of your business, um, do you also do domain buying and selling? Is that something that you do, do uh, on top of uh, having your online business? Yeah, uh, also, also let me just mention regarding the, the, our relationship with investors. So we have some criteria for investors. So we don't really take uh, on most investors who approach us. Our criteria is that people need to understand the business, have some experience with online businesses before either that they have invested or owned or operated their own business. And uh, so that they have an understanding of the risks and how it works. Because we found that people who don't have enough experience with that, they might not really know what it is and might not be aware of the risks. And then and then later they might have some expectations that, that they're not mad. So we, we want to make sure that we only accept investors that, that have a pretty good idea of what this is we are doing. So regarding your question about domain names, I used to be more involved in domain name trading, buying, selling premium domain names. Uh, recently, I don't really, I'm not actively involved. I just have a small portfolio, well, a few hundred domain names that, that are for sale that occasionally get sold to some end users. And it's it's been good, but I'm not so actively involved in it now. You, you know, uh, and I do want to get your opinion on, on domains, because you, you did mention um, risk before, and you mentioning that that was probably the most important part of the process that you have when you are vetting a, a business or an online business. 
Um, and then you mentioned the risk again, where you want to take on investors that are familiar with um, owning a, a business. What are the risks that are involved there with investing in an online business that, say, is already garnering uh, capital and has sales? What could go wrong? Yeah, so right now, uh, on average, you can buy an online business for about three times the annual profit. And so when you think about it, that's a 33% annual return. So that seems pretty good, right? Not, there is not that many uh, other options that can give you a almost guaranteed return that's that high. But then, of course, you have to take into account the risks. And I think the best way to look at it is the same way you would look at, at an offline business. So imagine you are going to go and buy a grocery store, like an actual physical grocery store. And then if you think about what are the risks that are involved in that, of course, you have some supply chain. You have to, to buy products. You, you have to make sure that you have good margins. You have to do some, some advertising, some marketing to make sure that you get customers. You have to have good employees to take care of everything. You have to make sure that, that everything is legal, that you pay the taxes, that you are compliant with all the local regulations, and so on and so forth. And I would say it's pretty similar to, to an online business. Like if you had an e-commerce business, the, the things, the risks you have to deal with, actually pretty similar, except you also have the platform risks. So for example, if you have a, a, an e-commerce business that sells products for Amazon primarily, then a big risk is that you could simply get, get banned by Amazon. And that happens from time to time. They have pretty strict rules about different things. So, so I've seen businesses, I've seen cases where people go and buy a business, buy a business for even for more than a million dollars. And then they simply get, get delisted from the platform. They simply get banned by Amazon and they lose everything. Wow. And that happens too. And with, um, with the content sites, the biggest risk is from Google, from getting some sort of penalty from the Google algorithm updates. Uh, so there are some really major risks involved in any type of online business. And, it, and like you said, it, it helps to have that uh, knowledge of SEO and keywords and maybe why did Google penalize you, right? And what can you do to make up for that? I, I, don't, I don't know if there's anything that you can do. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also something that happens very often for people who might not be as experienced in that. They often go and, and buy a content website and try to find a low-cost SEO service. And many of these low-cost SEO services typically over-promise and under-deliver. And in reality, you might end up causing more damage from, from the services rather than uh, benefit. So it's very easy to get a website penalized and then just lose traffic and lose revenue. That's just have a quick discussion, I guess, on domains, because that is something that our, our listeners and our subscribers are, are interested in. You know, recently there have even been, been some domain names that have been fractionalized and that's caused a lot of, you know, stir in the community. How do you view them now as, as investments? Um, and, and is that something also where it's not easy, right? Cause you have to sit on a domain name for maybe years and years before the right opportunity arrives to sell it. Uh, yeah, that's true. So, it's it's an interesting space with domain names. Uh, so right now I have about four or five hundred domain names, and my strategy is I just have them listed on different places with some prices, and people can come and buy them. And occasionally they sell. Like just last week, I sold a domain name called Studiomatic.com, and the buyer was actually the person who owned the domain Studiomatic.co. So that was a perfect match for them. And they paid $2,000. Uh, and I think I initially acquired the domain for maybe 50 or $100 or so uh, some years ago. So it's quite profitable. And, and But that's not a premium domain. It's just a domain that's like nice and, and a good brand potentially. And then we, we, we say premium domains. We generally talk about domains with the uh, popular one-word domains like cars.com or maybe two words that, that are very popular as well, like cryptocurrency.com. So those domains would potentially be worth in, in the millions of dollars. 
and uh, the the big value from that why 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 do they have so much uh, value why are they worth so much is the brand so uh, a large company a large corporation that that has billion dollar uh, budget for marketing it's a great deal for them to go and buy the main name like cars.com because that gives them instant instant recognition and they they put it in different ads they um people go and visit it directly people often type in the domain name cars.com or something like that so it gives them quite a lot of extra traffic and really helps with the marketing with the branding and and everyone wants to to have a short memorable domain so that really the values have been rising rapidly so the, those domains present quite a bit of value but there is also a risk one side of risks comes from new technologies there is new new domain name extensions like you know this dot co uh, and, and uh, like dot name or like a lot of different extensions now and you can actually go and buy your own extension like it could be dot michael <laughs> or, or anything yeah. like that yeah I could go and buy an extension dot domain magnate. Uh, so uh, the same name dot com is still uh, the king, right? And you know, and and I think that there was some uh, worries maybe that as those um, those domains start expanding, right? Like like you mentioned dot co dot um, x y z, that the names the brand names might be diluted a little bit, but dot com has remained, like you said, king. I mean, nothing replaces that dot com. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's hard to say. It's hard to predict. So I've um, I've spoken over the last few years with some uh, with some large domainers, with some really successful people who have millions of dollars in in their premium domain names, and many of them have, have actually been selling. <coughs> excuse me. In the past, in the past years, in the past decade, many of them have sold their their holdings. I think many people believe that. Of the market might be turning, but at the same time, there are also those who who keep buying and thinks that and think that prices will only go up. So it's really hard to predict at this point. Yeah, um, yeah. No, from what I've heard, even from from experts, is no one can no one can time the market. Um, you can only kind of you know have a have a, a strategy. Yeah. Um, uh, I I kind of want to. You know, if, if you don't mind me taking it, you know, into your kind of your ventures here, and um, I, I noticed that you have, uh, you know, your own podcast, and um, just curious, you know, as a podcaster, uh, what is it? Because you own, you you have a successful business, you run a successful business. Uh, what is your motivation for your podcast? You know, you've gotten some great uh, business leaders, some some uh, entrepreneurs. Um, what is it about the medium of podcasting that intrigues you? Yeah, it's been fun to be able to connect with different people from the industry. I would say the most, my, my favorite types of episodes to record are the ones with people that I already know from the industry that I've known for maybe many years. And we can just take an hour of our days and sit down and ch- chat about the business. And and that's fun. And, and we can also record that and share that online. And People then our listeners, our followers would, would enjoy that, would be able to learn more. So it seems like a great thing all around. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, because as I'm, I'm checking out your podcast and I found myself listening to uh, one of the episodes and I'm like, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not in, in, in the business world per se, uh, but I just find it um, so fascinating um, to have, like you said, a, a sit down for an hour and you chat and you're talking about, you know, your experiences, um, strategies, and, um, and you get to kind of see what different people are doing, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And also it's been an opportunity for me to learn some new things. Sometimes I have guests on my podcast that can talk about things where I don't know that much about, like we had an expert on, on accounting, or we had people that specialize in raising capital for for startups and 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 those are topics where i'm not an expert at all so it was really interesting to just be able to ask them questions and be uh, and be there to listen and learn yeah it's a great it's a great medium um especially if you're just like sitting down and and listening uh 
to two people just have conversations. Um, what are what are some uh, we're we're deep in we're two months into twenty twenty two. Uh, you know, you leave behind 2020, you think 2021, 2022 are going to be better. <laughs> uh, and then, and then who knows what, you know, war breaks loose, inflation, gas prices. Um, and I'm just, just as me kind of going on a tangent. Um, but we're two months in, right? Uh, we have 10 months left in the year. What are some things that you see? What are some trends, some predictions, um, that you might kind of feel comfortable throwing out there, not making, but throwing out there um, as opportunities for people? Yeah, a very interesting question. So a big trend we've seen during the pandemic is that everything is just going online, everything is going remote. A lot more people realized that they can get a fully remote job. And a lot more businesses realized that they need to be selling online more. And, and also many people are uh, starting to look into acquiring a business versus just having a job, they realize that the job cannot give them enough security because anything could happen. So it's been interesting to, to notice. And I've seen many, many industries online really going uh, up rapidly because of that. I think that it's, it's hard to predict future trends, but I think that there is always going to be some interest in in owning your own business, so that's always going to have quite a bit of um, quite a bit of demand in that area. Have you seen that? Have you seen that uh, the demand has increased in, for your company? Have you been approached by more people because maybe you have a, a, set, a set of people that have worked, you know, they're 55, 60 years old, and they're they can retire, but they want to do something else, uh, and they have the capital to invest in an online business. Um, and they're tired of going to the office. Like, have you seen that kind of person, you know, uh, reach out to you more? Yeah, absolutely. Most of our investors, most of the people that invest in our funds and work with us, are those who have some jobs. So they have some, some businesses, some online or offline businesses, and they are mostly looking for some more passive investments. And they're also looking to learn more about this online business space so that they can go and operate their own businesses. But I'd say the bigger trend we've seen is there is just a lot more capital flowing in that space. There is a lot more people that go and set up some kind of funds and groups and raise capital to go and buy online businesses and a lot more people who are looking to invest in it. So I think this is growing a lot. I do think that we might be approaching some sort of temporary peak in that area so that the interest might drop down after a bit but right now it's still growing quickly and the multiples for online businesses are also growing the prices are going up yeah um so the prices to acquire them or to buy one you're saying yeah absolutely so uh the the, the prices to buy an online business an established online business are typically a, a multiple of the profit of the annual profit so if if we look at, at the markets maybe 10 years ago you could acquire a profitable online business for only one time the, the, the annual profit. So let's say a business is earning $100,000 per year. You could buy it for like $100,000 per year, more or less. And then uh, since then, it's been growing steadily. And now it's an average of three years of uh, three times the annual profit or even more. So that $100,000 uh, per year business would be worth more than 300,000 right now. What is your advice there for someone that's coming in? What would be a healthy multiplier? Because I do wonder about that. Like, is it worth buying a business that's uh, has a Forex multiplier? I mean, that's going to take you, who knows um, how long to pay that back potentially, right? Because like you said, there, there's so many risks, anything can happen. Yeah. So that's very interesting. And uh, until a few years ago, I was very very adamant about just going for the cheaper deals and, and buying as little as po at, a, at a low multiple as possible to really make the profit because you buy cheap, buy solid businesses cheap. But now what I'm seeing is because the market has changed so much, it's really hard to find deals at lower multiples. And that puts you at a major disadvantage because you, are, you can only buy 
much lower quality businesses if you are looking at if you are very price conscious. So I think a much better strategy now is to go for something that is solid, that is long term, buy a business that has at least two, three years of solid history and, and make sure that you don't pay a ridiculously high price, of course, but paying around market value or slightly higher, I think is reasonable if you get something that's very high quality. Michael, thank you so much for, you know, for sharing your insights. Is there anything else that somebody maybe that's, um, that's interested in, in learning more about online businesses that they're maybe interested in acquiring one or, or maybe investing in one? What are some resources and can they reach out to you even? Yeah, thanks, Horacio. Nice to talk to you. And people are welcome to subscribe for our weekly newsletter. We send newsletter every couple of weeks to go to domainmagnate.com slash newsletter. And that provides some market information, like recent articles, latest news, as well as our own personal news and, uh, and offers from the company. And check out our podcast. It's called The Domain Magnate Show, and it's available on iTunes and uh, YouTube and basically everywhere you get podcasts. And people are welcome to just contact me directly. You can email michael at domainmagnate.com or look me up on Facebook, Michael Bereslavsky. Happy to answer any questions directly. That's great, uh, Michael. And I know you will have people reaching out to you. Thanks again, Michael. Um, look forward to you know keeping in touch. And uh, best of luck to you. I hope you have a good rest of uh, you know, March and, and April, at least. <laughs> Thanks, Horacio. And uh, great to chat with you. Have a good day. Take care. I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Michael. What stood out to me the most was his advice to focus on learning and developing your skills in order to build your business. And really that applies to any part of your everyday life. I'm also realizing how he took his expertise of buying and selling online businesses to spin another business out of it through his fund. Make sure you also catch Michael on the Domain Magnate podcast where he interviews and gets tons of insights from other entrepreneurs and business leaders. If you enjoyed today's podcast, let others know about it. We find our guests so interesting and knowledgeable, and I know others will too. Or leave a review or hit the follow button. Until the next episode, take care.